Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. Um, if you'd like to all take your places for this next session, which we're going to, we've got about 45 minutes, uh, to talk about great leaders' difficult decisions. Uh, and I hadn't realised the sort of scale of the crisis in leadership within health, uh, just in terms of the shortage of people who are willing to take on top jobs. Um, I was hearing a figure, we were just discussing whether it's true or not, that the average tenure of, of chief executives now is less than two years. Um, so to talk about what can be done to address that, what makes a good leader, um, <clears throat> we have got, of course, a panel of great leaders, um, just as you would expect. Uh, can I introduce, first of all, Jan So... I, I, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got it wrong so many different times. Jan Sobieri, and Jan is from the NHS Leadership Academy, um, a relatively new organisation, although I realise that I'm at risk of saying that with everybody I introduce at the moment. Um, Ian Cumming, Health Education England, uh, a former chief executive in a number of different roles of West Midlands, uh, SHA, Strategic Health Authority in North Lancashire, uh, PCT before that. Uh, Peter Lees uh, on the far... No, Peter Lees here. I'm doing it the wrong way around. Ian Cummings on the far side, Health Education England. You throw me... Oh, you see, you guys know. <laughs> let me introduce Amanda in a minute, because let me get it right. Uh, Ian Cumming, as you'll recognise, is on the far side. Peter Lees... <laughs> I'm not going to get anything right. At least I got Jeremy Hunt's name right, and believe me, I was concentrating hard. <laughs> so where was I? Ian, I've introduced. Let's introduce Amanda. I can cope with that. Dr. Amanda Doyle is co-chair of the NHSCC, the cl uh, clinical commissioners, the umbrella bo body for CCGs, um, and also is chief clinical officer, so the lead GP at NHS Blackpool, CCG. Um, and Finally, where did we get to? Uh, Peter Lees, who is from the Faculty of Medical Leadership, another relatively new body, um, uh, whose job is to encourage doctors to be managers or to become leaders. So we're going to hear from each of them in turn, then we'll get some questions. Um, but let's start with Jan. I'm not even going to try with your surname. Let's just go with Jan. Do you want to take Hello, and, uh, and thanks for the invitation to be here. So my brief, um, we, and we only have about five or six minutes each, and my brief is to look at the set of decisions that I, I think leaders are facing. And I look at this from two perspectives. One, uh, as I was a chief exec in the NHS in uh, provider services across a range of organisations, and then latterly as a PCT chief exec, and then currently looking at it from the viewpoint of the NHS Leadership Academy. And when I talk to people, I was in the bar like many of you last night, talking to people about the issues that they face, uh, and it was great to hear the Secretary of State agreeing with me this morning. We, we see people talking about the challenge of providing a better integration around vulnerable people. We, we, we hear people talking about the need to provide much more support for people with long-term conditions in the community. And we, need, we hear people talking about we need to deliver a sustainable urgent care model. And what strikes me around those, and of course there are many other issues, what strikes me about those is that they are at a scale and of a nature which we have never seen before. And if you, if you take those sorts of issues apart, what do we see? We see uh, there are no short-term fixes, that they are really complex, often with financial and information models that don't quite fit, they're fairly inadequate. They run across a range of organisations. The edges are very blurred. There's obviously often a lot of controversy around what the solutions or, or the way forward might look like. There's often a moral or ethical dimension to them. There's clearly no easy answers. And ultimately, they're really ambiguous in their nature. So they're different to the problems we've seen in the past. We're looking at these issues in the context of a new system that requires organizations, teams, and individuals to work together like never before. There's an expectation of interconnectedness around how we should operate. And everyone's expected, but also everyone has the right of veto. And of course, within this, quite rightly, our patients and our public don't understand that complexity. All they want are organizations, teams, and individuals led by 
excellent leaders to work together around what they need. Keith Grin, who many of you will come across, talk about, talks about these as wicked problems. They're fundamentally different from the same problems we've had in the past. So when I was a chief exec of a hospital, it didn't feel like it at the time, but I was dealing mostly with tame problems. If you put the right sequence of events together, processes, interventions, it could be resources, it could be information, it could be meetings, whatever, you eventually unlock the puzzle and the problem was solved, the solution emerged. Some of those were quite tough, but they were tame problems. The sorts of issues I think we're addressing now are wicked. They're at unprecedented scale. And my personal view is that our leaders are spending too much time on the tame issues because they're the ones we're used to dealing with and are easy to fix. And we should be spending more time on those wicked issues, which often require sustained effort over many months or years to, to find a way forward. The first time I came across a really big wicked issue was when I became PCT Chief Exec in Sheffield. And somebody told me as part of our strategy work, there was a life expectancy gap of 13 years between the best and the worst neighbourhoods, only a few miles apart. I was stunned by that fact. So I did what I normally did as I opened my leadership toolbox, I reached in and there was nothing there for me that would work. I didn't even know what the right question to ask was. What's the role of healthcare in tackling that issue? What's the role of the NHS? What's the role of the PCT? How far do we go with housing, education, involving people around diet, activity, social care? I was daunted. I was quite scared, frankly. This is something I thought the PCT had a role to play in. I didn't know what to do. I asked people. Eventually, we got in the Health Foundation, London School of Economics. We involved patients, their carers, clinicians, to come up with a way forward, not to solve the problem, because I realised we weren't going to do that, but to find a way forward, to make some early steps. Imagine being in a room with people with cancer, because we concentrated on cancer services and mental health, who for the first time realised that their life expectancy was not due, due to their condition, but actually a whole range of factors which we, which we as a system could influence. Very challenging for us in the PCT. Uh, and I, I don't pretend we sorted it. What we did is we found a way of asking questions and find some mechanisms to, to, uh, to, take, to take some steps. And the Health Foundation have now promoted one of the things we did, only one of the actions called the STAR model, which is a way of allocating resources, which is really, really helpful. So if that's the context, um, can we expect our leaders who have been dealing with tame problems to suddenly have the ability to cope with these massive wicked issues? Is it reasonable for us to expect our leaders to work in that environment? I don't think it is. The Leadership Academy, which hopefully you'll be aware of, was formed last year as an organisation designed to support leaders to make them outstanding so they can improve patient outcomes and experience. So we're not the only answer, but we're part of a suite of interventions to support our leaders. Our job is to promote the great leadership that already exists, and I know that a lot of people are already doing with this really, really well, to recognise great leadership, and we've got a, a really good scheme going out through our local delivery partners, our 10 local delivery partners, to recognise great leadership, and we were quite humble as a system around this, and we don't need to be. And also provide a, a suite of toolkits and support to enable our leaders to do the best they can. And lastly, uh, we've launched in the last few weeks a suite of programmes that will support leaders at all levels, from the very junior levels all the way to very senior levels, levels to be the best they can be and equip them with new skills, knowledge, experiences and ultimately behaviours that will enable them to, to tackle these wicked issues and to take NHS services forward. And I'm very happy to spend a bit more time, if we have, through questions or on our stand to talk about these. Thank you very much. Let's hear now from Ian Cumming from Health Education England. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jan. Leadership. 
What is leadership? Well, we could spend uh, most of the rest of the afternoon trying to define leadership, but for the purposes of my few minutes, what I want to do is to just try and differentiate between leadership and management. I'm not going to talk about management this morning, this afternoon. And to me, leadership is about people. Management is about tasks. You lead people, you manage a bank account. You can be a leader without having managerial functions, and I think that's critically important in our NHS. But equally, you can be a manager without being a leader. Developing as a leader is like learning to ride a bike, in my opinion. So when you learn to ride a bike, you see other people do it. We can watch plenty of people riding a bike. That still doesn't mean you can ride a bike. We can pick up a textbook and we can learn from the laws of physics how you can balance on two rotating wheels. Still doesn't mean you can ride a bike. What you have to do is to get on that bike and practice. Not only do you have to get on that bike and practice, but you have to get on that bike with somebody holding on to the back of your saddle, one of your parents, or with stabilizers on until you've developed the skills that you need to be able to undertake that particular task. It's exactly the same with leadership. We cannot throw people into positions and expect them to function as leaders without developing, as, as Jan said, the tools in the toolbox to allow them to fulfill their role. I'm going to talk about three areas in my career that I've found to be some of the most challenging leadership decisions. And they're around patience, they're around places, and they're around people. So patience, I took up post as chief exec of the West Midlands SHA uh, a few weeks after the Healthcare Commission report into the failings at Mid Staffordshire Foundation Trust had been produced. And over the next three years or so, um, I worked very closely with colleagues across the health system, trying to understand what had gone wrong at Mid Staffordshire and to understand what we needed to do to put it right. It was one of the biggest wake-up moments for me in my entire career. I've worked as a chief exec in the health service since 1995. I've worked in the health service since 1982. And I have never come across such a systemic failure of leadership and management and professional behavior in one single organization. And the fact that that has allowed, been allowed to happen in our NHS means that we need to look long and hard at the leadership that we have and how we actually fulfill our roles. Places. Over my career, I've been involved in many consultations about reconfigurations of services, but we got it wrong. We, as the NHS, decided what the service change was, and then we went out to try and convince the public about why what we had decided was right. If any of you have done any work with uh, bereavement counselling, you will know that there's an emotional response to people that suffer unexpected bereavement of a, a close family member or friend, which, which, simplifying, it runs through the cycle of sadness, anger, resentment, and then ultimately acceptance. It's the same with enforced change, and enforcing change on our patients and on a public without them properly being brought into making the decisions in the first place triggers those responses of sadness, anger, resentment, and acceptance. And if you think back, to difficult changes that you've been involved in. I'm sure you would understand those emotions. And quite often, actually, in many places, people never make it to acceptance. They stick around the anger and resentment. That builds in the population, and that's one of the challenges that we have as a healthcare system. People. I believe that the health service should recruit for values. We should appraise for values. We should train for values. And we should fire people that don't abide by the values of our healthcare system. I don't think we're particularly good at doing that last part. If we're serious about the people who we want to be delivering care in our healthcare system, we need to make sure that everybody is operating by the right values and behaviours. One of the difficult roles that SHA chief execs have is to move people on who aren't delivering in a job. But I think we need to differentiate between people who aren't delivering yet have the right values, but potentially are in the wrong role, and how we look after them, and how we make sure that we find a, re a role for them where they can continue to deliver. Because let's face it, the vast majority of people don't go to work to try and do a bad job. And those people that have the wrong value set to work in our environment. 
So to conclude, I'd just like you to think about leadership styles. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Daniel Goleman looking at the six leadership styles that many of us move seamlessly between in our day-to-day -day operating, but not all of us. And some of the leaders that aren't successful in our health service are people who tend to stick with one particular leadership style. So Daniel Goleman's six leadership styles are affiliative, democratic, communicative, commanding, sorry, visionary, pace setting, and coaching. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, if Jan was to collapse on the floor now with a heart attack and, heaven help him, I was the most qualified person here to help resuscitate him. <laughs> and I had a team of people who were sat at the front here surrounding me, helping me. I suspect Jan would not want me to demonstrate a democratic leadership style on how we're going to resuscitate him. That would not be the best way in a time-critical environment to get what we needed. What you would need in that particular style is a commanding approach, telling people what to do in the interest of saving his life. However, if the resuscitation was successful, I'd need to move into a different leadership style. People might be frightened. People might want to learn from it. People might be upset. So, how would I move towards an affiliative style to have that conversation and that discussion with people? It's just the same way as we go about our day-to-day -day jobs. We cannot have one style and stick with it. We have to move between styles in our leadership role. And the final point I would lead you with is there are two types of people in this world, those that have a can-do attitude and those that have a can't-do attitude. I have never met a successful leader with a can't-do attitude. Thank you. Next up, Peter Lees from the Faculty of Medical Leadership. No, I'm Ian Cumming. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Basil Fawlty, in one of his uh, exasperated exchanges with Sybil, said, let's get you on to mastermind, Sybil. Subject, art of the bleeding obvious. Um, I am slightly nervous with such a, a, an erudite audience to talk about the bleeding obvious, but that's what I'm, I'm going to do. Uh, but actually, I'm unapologetic also, because what I'm going to talk about is people. Uh, my favorite definition of leadership is that leadership is about getting results with and through people. Uh, no people, no results. And when we look at the challenges uh, that we currently face, and the bit on the left is just to remind you which bunch of butts got us into this mess, um, this is a, a challenge uh, unprecedented in our history. We need the kind and clever people uh, that were talked about on the first slide, but we need engaged and motivated uh, staff uh, all working together to try and, and solve this. This is not going to be solved, as you know, by a few people sitting uh, in an office. Um, discretionary effort is something that, that we all want. Uh, discretionary effort, as you can see there, is the difference between what effort you can put in, uh, in at work and the minimum uh, amount you can put in without getting sacked. Um, and of course, and I, I'm personally convinced the difference between a good organization and a great organization is the discretionary effort that staff will put in, and it will be fairly obvious to you that disgruntled uh, silo working staff who spend their time liberally passing the blame, which does go on, I believe, in some places, uh, are, are not the most committed, and therefore their discretionary effort reduces. And I thought I've had the privilege, if privilege is the right word, to be involved in, in a number of major incidents in my career. Um, and when you see how the NHS pulls together on one of those occasions, I have this dream of an NHS where we do that every day of the week and it doesn't take a major incident to produce that. Um, simple quote which I'll leave you to read yourself. You might think that this is the typical clinician taking a swipe at, uh, at management colleagues. This uh, was uh, quoted is from Gordon Bethune, who some of you will know was the guy that turned around Continental Airlines at the beginning of the 1990s, which was going about to go into its third phase of bankruptcy. So this is not an issue that faces us just singly as a public sector. But it's very interesting if you read his book, and I think it's out of print now, so I got a second-hand copy from, from Amazon. If you read his book, what they did was that they engaged people. 
Um, and they engaged people incredibly well. They had to make tough decisions. But it felt like a, a situation not too distant uh, from where we sit at the moment. I've wondered for ages since my days in, uh, in an SHA what happened to the Borman report. I've been told beforehand that, uh, that maybe actually there is a bit more activity going on. But Steve Borman's report is absolutely amazing. This is not pink and fluffy stuff, this looking after people. Because when you look at this, if you have organizations, Trust A, as you can probably guess, has better HR practices and, and, and more satisfied staff than Trust D. And there's a difference in mortality rates. There's a difference in patient satisfaction rates. Uh, and if you look at the bottom slide, I'm sure you're all ahead of me, and I won't insult you by going through the details of that. So there's, there's real hard productivity gains in this, but there's also massive benefits for patients. And when you start to talk about behavior and benefits for patients, you have to talk about Michael West. And this is just one example of uh, his, his amazing work that shows that if you have good team working in your organization, then you will have a lower mortality rate than if you have poor team working in your organization. Now tell me that leadership and team working and management is pink and fluffy and something that we should just learn about towards the end of our careers. It's absolutely not. Um, the last bit of theory I want to, to throw at you is, is how does all this hang together? This is meant to be about leadership and how do we get from leadership to the sort of outcomes we want? And this is one of, of many, I'm sure, but this is a particularly good study, I think. The Sears, the uh, North American department store, was going down the tubes. Financially, the turnaround people came in and sorted out, and some bright spark said, but if we don't engage the staff, then we will end up in exactly the same place again. They got into a big staff engagement, staff education, uh, and, and staff motivation process, and delivered sustainable change. And you can see there, and I suspect you've read up the list already, but basically good leadership inside the organization, staff liked. Over time, staff became loyal. Loyal staff, going back to the discretionary effort, delivered better value and productivity for customers, which they quite liked. They became loyal. Growth and productivity went up. My big anxiety, and I think there is an anxiety, uh, if, I, if I may just take a swipe at the political mindset, is that we look at that bit at the top, which is really so important to us, is getting customer loyalty, of delivering the right sort of things for patients. And then we look further down the chain, and we, talk, we blame the people further down the chain. If we want compassionate care for patients, we should treat our staff with the same compassion we expect them to deliver. And I think we're quite a long way off the mark on that. And my organization has been thinking about this, and that's just translating a day into our colors and be into NHS speak. And I've talked to thousands of people about this now, and I haven't anybody that has disagreed with the principle. Um, just to get me off my soapbox, this is uh, just to prove to you that I've gone completely barking, but this is a great book. Um, which talks about lots of HR practice in the private sector. And uh, basically, if you give your cow a name, you get an awful lot more milk. And having been obsessed through my clinical career with the pathophysiology of prolactin, I think I can probably work out why. But um, the reaction of, uh, of, of some farmers, you can see there, um, all to, uh, to increase the milk yield. So I question, what do we do? Well, step number one, when we hit the buffers, which has happened to me so many times in my career, is that. <laughs> Apart from my concern for the biscuit industry, um, what we lose in discretionary effort uh, is far greater than what we save in a few pence uh, getting rid of the biscuits. And don't you think we're all ridiculously hierarchical? And I, I'm sure you're not, but my tribe is and needs to change. And if I can also have a little swipe at Francis, uh, the thought of adding criminal prosecution to everybody's concerns is not the way to get the best out of your staff. Um, this is not my best slide, but this basically on the left-hand side, if you take Steve Borman's report, Steve Borman's report, there's lots of structural stuff we can do, but I like Gordon Bethune's stuff on the, on the right-hand side. This is something that we can all do tomorrow. We can just be a bit nicer, a bit more decent to the staff that we deal with, and they will react appropriately. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian, uh, Peter, and finally, Dr. Amanda Doyle. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I was asked to talk about difficult commissioning decisions. Um, I think before talking about that, it's really important that we understand the context 
um, in, which, in the environment in which CCGs are making decisions. CCGs are different from previous NHS commissioning organisations where membership organisations. Our members are our GP practices, and we can't make decisions as leaders in those organisations without the agreement of those practices. This means that when something happens or something goes wrong, we have to change our plans, we have to change our budgets, we have to go back to our practices and get them to say that's okay. It's a very, very different environment um, to be working in. I have been appointed as Chief Officer of our CCG, but to keep that job, I have to be re-elected every two years by our member practices. Um, and that makes for a slightly different way of working um, than the way PCT chief execs do. But within that context, there's um, a couple of principles that I try to, to bear in mind when I'm making decisions, um, commissioning decisions. They're not rocket science. Um, the first one um, is to look at the evidence. There's lots and lots of evidence out there there's lots of evidence about what is clinically effective care, about what is cost-effective care, about what interventions you need to make to have the most impact. Um, there's lots of resources out there, um, people to work with. Um, there's NICE, there's increasingly clinical senates um, who are able to provide a lot of that um, information, particularly around clinical effectiveness for us, and we should use that. We should decide what our priorities are, look at what is most likely to have the most impact on those priorities and just do it. Um, I'm based in Blackpool and Blackpool has the worst life expectancy in the country. Huge key priority for us. And we did some work um, with a guy called Professor Chris Bentley, uh, initially from the um, Health Inequalities National Support Team. And Chris came along, looked at all our data, looked at all our statistics, said, yes, you've got a problem. Um, and said to us, look, the biggest single thing you can do in Blackpool to improve life expectancy is to find people who've got hypertension and don't know it and treat them, and to find people who know they've got hypertension but who aren't treated to target and treat them to target. Our member practice said, right, well, if that's what we've got to do, then we do it. Um, and we had a big um, publicity campaign. We invested in... Um, extra nursing time in community and primary care. We went all out just to do that one thing. We're now seven months into that scheme. Um, more than 10,000 people have come forward to have their blood pressure checked. We've got 1,000 more hypertensives on registers and treated. Now, seven months in, that equates to 25 less cardiovascular events, 25 less heart attacks and strokes per year. That's a really significant impact um, in a town like Blackpool. Um, but it's important to recognise that it's just one measure, but what we did was looked at what we needed to do, um, and we just did it. The other principle, again, it's not rocket science, it's something um, I ask myself and I ask my staff. Um, if you wouldn't commission a service for your family or yourself, if you wouldn't want that service for yourself, then don't commission it for our patients. Very basic, but if you ask yourself that question every time you commission a service, you won't be going far wrong. Anyone who was watching the um, Northwest News last night might have seen Blackpool CCG um, getting called for everything because we had terminated a contract with a nursing home earlier this week. Um, we had significant concerns about quality standards in that nursing home. It was not a place I would send any member of my family and so it's not a place that I want any of my patients to go. But we got quite a hard time. We'd worked for a long time with this provider, um, as had the CQC. Um, we got quite a hard time when we pulled the contract, and they said to us, look, how can you sleep at night? Um, you're taking away our livelihood. People will lose their jobs. This nursing home will close down. But actually, how could I sleep at night if I didn't do that? How can I sleep at night if I'm not assured that vulnerable people for whom we're responsible are getting the best quality of care that they can? And the answer is, I can't. Um, but these aren't easy decisions to make. Uh, and even when you've made the, the decisions, it's not easy to implement them. And, and you need to demonstrate some very clear leadership around taking some of these decisions. 
I would also like us to start the conversation as leaders of the system about some of the difficult decisions that we all need to make together. It was quite interesting listening to the Secretary of State this morning talking about A&E, talking about pressures in the system, GP contract again. Um, pressures on A&E are a symptom, not the disease. They're a symptom of pressures in the rest of the system. What we've got to do is stop being distracted by talks of looking at the GP contract, by talking about out of hours. What we need to do is look at primary and community care and transform them to deliver what we want in the system now, to deliver care for the frail, elderly, vulnerable population. Um, and when we're doing that, we need to look at what we want them to not do. So what we can't do is change primary care so that it delivers everything we want while still allowing primary care to provide rapid access to everybody for everything whenever they want. We need to prioritise. We need to look at what we really want that system to deliver. Do we really want to be an occupational health service for the benefits agency? We might not. We might want to get our system delivering something else. Um, but we start, need to start having those conversations now. Um, we need to talk about out-of-hour services. But actually, it doesn't matter whose responsibility out-of-hour services are. It's no different um, before 2004, when I was responsible for out-of-hours care. It was provided by the same people that provide it now. It's just that somebody else commissioned it. Um, we need to just make sure that the quality is high, um, that we're not using A&E as a fallback um, for everybody, and that really we get community services right. Um, I think there's some difficult challenges ahead for us, and as leaders, I think we need to step up to the mark and start having the conversation. Thank you. I'm going to come out for questions in a minute. I just want to ask um, you, though, you're obviously all leaders. Do you understand why other people don't want to be, given your own personal experiences, given what you say about, for example, what happened with the nursing home? Did you think, oh, I shouldn't be, you know... The comeback, the reaction to that, does, you, does it... Did it make you question the prominent position you have? Um, no, no. I think, um, I think it's important that people are prepared to stand up uh, and make these decisions, but these decisions aren't made by one individual. It's made by a team of people. It's just one individual stood up there. But you were giving me a fascinating statistic earlier about the numbers that there used to be for the top job and the numbers that there are now. Yes, I think it was, I was first appointed as an acute trust chief exec in 1995, and there were 72 people at that stage that applied for that job. When I moved on from being an acute trust chief exec in 2006, there were three applicants for that chief exec's job. So the jobs have become significantly less popular over time. And I think it's, it's a combination of reasons. It is about the leadership challenge. It is about certainly increasingly some of the people that, that I mentor over the years, people have, that I've mentored have aspired to be chief executives. They don't seem to be doing that quite the same anymore. They're aspiring for perhaps next level down jobs. Um, be, because in many of them are saying that um, um, why would they want to take on that, that additional pressure of taking the chief exec role? So where are they going to come from, do you reckon, Jan? The next generation of these inspirational leaders who are going to follow the advice we've been hearing? Well, I'm quite heartened, actually, by the, the uh, people I talk to. Um, and the Academy's been running a senior uh, nurse midwife program. And there's a lot of people out there that are very willing to take on the jobs. They just need the support that we can offer them and others can offer them. I was talking to a chief exec yesterday, first time chief exec, and what unlocked it for him was going on a program. Um, and a, a right package of support that give, gave him some skills and gave him some um, knowledge, but also gave him some confidence that he could do these jobs. The jobs have got bigger, they're more pressurised, um, uh, there are a lot of people that uh, are uh, not as resilient perhaps as they should be. We can, we can support them. It's very interesting. You, can you learn to be a leader, or is it because a lot of people you can? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, Could you take any, can anybody learn to be there a is, leader? There are certain personality traits that are very helpful to be a leader, but I, I'm absolutely convinced that there are very few people who are just born as leaders. 
that you need to you need to learn, as Jan said, that you have the tools in your toolbox. It's it's the learning to ride a bike um, analogy. You need to work with people. You need to understand what works with you and how to operate in different situations. Uh, okay, let's get some questions from the floor. Have we got some microphones out? If you right, there's a couple of hands up here on microphone three. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. It's uh, Sue Browning from the Charter Society of Physiotherapy. And uh, uh, Peter, thank you very much for raising the Borman report. Uh, it is quite astonishing that it was four years ago now that uh, he came up with the potential to reduce sickness absence in the NHS by a third um, and uh, helping people by helping people stay in work, staff stay in work and get them back to work earlier. Uh, and the, and the, the challenge in leadership terms is it's not a complicated issue. To use Jan's language, it's not a, not a wicked issue. In fact, in NHS terms, it's actually very straightforward and quite a simple scenario um, and uh, has potential to, uh, to uh, get a return on investment for at least three pounds for every pound invested. So in leadership terms, my question is, what do you think would unlock the ability for this to come in? If you want a one-word answer, I think we need to value and professionalise HR much more than it is currently valued. I think it was a big mistake not for, H for HR directors not to be statutory roles on boards at the beginning. And, and I th but I think there's also a big challenge there for the HR community, because this is their evidence base, and why they aren't screaming it from the rooftops. I don't know. Okay. Microphone one. Um, I want to reflect on top positions in the NHS and ask the panel the question about why we have so few uh, black people, gay people, or women in any of those top roles. And what I'm reflecting is, is that because they don't want them, or is it a failure of leadership development, or have we just got the culture wrong? I'm really pleased you raised this, and I've, on my note I've said, let's talk about diversity, because you're absolutely right, and I think it's a failure of the system. Um, so it's, for me, it's not a numbers game. For me, this is about taking the wicked issues I've described and saying, have we got the capability and capacity across our systems to deal with these really tough issues, and have we got the different and innovative approaches? And the reality is, if we have a certain cadre of leaders, there might be white, male, middle class, for example, that lead organisations, are, are, is it likely that those people coming at it from a particular cultural perspective will have the inno innovation and improvement uh, ideas, the perspectives, the cultural shifts required? And the next generation that you said you're excited about in the middle? So, uh, so uh, as I'm talking to people and as we're uh, working with the programme, we have more conditions, we have a range of leaders, and we want a great diversity, and we're seeing that coming through. It's really fundamental that we have this diversity. It is coming through. It will come. I think it will take a lot of time. One of, the, one of the big challenges for us all, I think, is this is a sustained intervention over a number of years. You cannot, this isn't, what we're talking about today is not a quick fix. What we see from elsewhere, the people we talk to in commercial sectors and elsewhere, they, they look at it over a 10 year plus period. Okay. Peter, did you want to say something? Yeah, else? I, I mean, two things really. One is, I, I suppose it's my surgical background suggests this, but I think we should just have some blunt instruments. I think we should just, I, you know, I, we've talked about logic and we've talked about evolution, and the evolution is not happening fast enough in any of those areas and will not happen fast enough for the next 20 years. So I think we've just got to do something pretty stark and blunt. But there is, we do. Like what? Quotas? I, 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 well, I'm no expert, and I can see quite a few experts in the audience, but I would go for quotas personally. Okay. Um, and just one other, one other thing, I mean, my organisation's got 1,000 junior doctors as half of our membership we got to in a year, but only 30% of those are women, and only 30% of the medical students joining are women. So there is an issue somewhere in our system that says to those people that actually these are not jobs for them. There's an awful lot of women GPs, aren't they? And they're all in trouble because they keep going off and having babies. Well, that's, that's it. I, I read in the newspapers this morning that I'm a burden on the NHS. Well, you know, we cannot train 70% of GPs, women to be 70% of GPs, and not expect them to have babies. But what sort of message does that give? Are those 30% of junior doctors who are women are reading and hearing that sort of thing said very openly and overtly and agreed with? Um, that's not going to inspire them to come forward and take up leadership roles. Microphone three. Hi, Debbie Fleming, um, Area Director for Wessex, down the south of the country, for NHS England. I just really wanted to make an observation about um, the importance of 
organisations within a community coming together to support leadership development. So um, within Thames Valley and, and, and Wessex, there's the Leadership Academy there. We, I see loads of fantastic leaders across lots of different organisations, and we're all going to be working longer. Actually, people need to be encouraged and supported to cross boundaries, to work in different organisations, and not to feel frightened that they're, you know, it's wrong to want to make that move or that they'll be in difficulty with their own chief executive if they want to make a change to another potential competitor. So I think you know, where you see really good leadership in a local setting, encouraging organisations to work together and look at developing their whole cadre of leaders and supporting development across organisations, and that's where a lot of them will come from in the future, and there's a lot of really good people out there. But I keep wondering, listening to all this, about the culture that is existing now within... I mean, it's so difficult to talk about the NHS as sort of one... Uh, one culture, because I know it's across, that, that it is so difficult and that there is a culture that people, A, don't want to be and, and are talking in the way, a way that they have over the last two days about the difficulties. Of... It doesn't sound like it's... A, I mean, it, sorry, but it doesn't always sound like it's a very nice place to work. Well, okay. <laughs> oh, I disagree. It, it can be a fantastic yeah. place. I mean, I, I chose to be Chief Executive in the mid-90s and I had a fantastic career. Yeah. I mean, a great job. I felt very privileged to be a Chief Executive. I'm sure there are many people here. It's fantastic. And did very you run rewarding. a happy ship? Of course I did. <laughs> Most of the time. You all ran happy ships. It's just everybody else's ships who aren't, isn't very happy. <laughs> um, the, the issue, I mean, first of all, I am tremendously proud to work for the NHS. I think it's a fantastic employer. It's Everybody given me a that. range of opportunities. I, I joined the NHS as a trainee biomedical scientist. I've worked in commissioners. I've worked in provider organisations. I've worked in regions. I'm okay. now in health education. And England. everybody's proud. But why is it so unhappy? Because we get, at the moment in particular, it's because of, of the pressures associated with the failings in care that are receiving much, much more media coverage than ever the successes in care do. And of course, we need to focus on those areas. But if you're working day in, day out, doing your best for patients with constrained resources, and all you're hearing in the media is how bad the NHS is. Okay, that but hold on. The NHS was on not on Staffordshire at all. Oh, sorry, the media was not on Staffordshire at all when they should have been, and that does not sound like it was a happy ship, and it was certainly the repercussions of that were obvious. If you look at our staff survey results, they're not as bad as you're portraying. So our staff exactly. survey results, uh, despite all the difficulties, are, are holding up pretty well. I think, coming back to Peter's point around health and well-being, there is something, and it's something we talked about in the Academy and around the Wicked Issues, that we need to address, which is about how we engage our staff, how we are much more transparent and open, how we empower staff. And that, I think, will unlock lots of the potential to move forward. Empowering staff. Yeah, uh, now, the, sorry, the quest, speaker on microphone number four, the lady over there in the yellow. Um, Salma Ali, Chief Officer of Warsaw CCG. Um, I certainly wouldn't um, disagree that there aren't wicked problems within the NHS, but do you think sometimes the way we as leaders construct problems perhaps leads to us constructing problems that appear to be wicked when actually they could be relatively straightforward? So, for example, the one around recruitment of BME leaders, I'm not convinced that's a wicked problem. I think the solutions may be relatively straightforward, but I think sometimes the way we construct it may appear... What's the solution to you? Well, I think there are a number of solutions, but I think the first issue for us is how we actually construct that problem. And I think we construct it as overly complex, and I think we need to deconstruct it in a way that's relatively straightforward. One of the panel members talked about quotas. I'm not convinced that's the answer, but there will be other answers that actually could help address that in a relatively quick rather than a long-term way. Does anybody want to respond to that? No, okay. Okay. We'll note the point and we'll go to microphone one. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ian Black and I'm a chairman of a Foundation Trust. We've only really got one job, which is to get the right person in as chief exec and keep them there. My question is about diversity. Can, can, the, do, I don't know the situation. Do you have a, a, a good chief exec and, and can you hold on to them? I mean, he, He's behind my left shoulder and he's very good. So he's, he's obviously good. excellent. Uh, how long has he been in post? Uh, six years, I think. Okay, okay. Um, and then the other part of our role, of course, is if we haven't got one, is to move them on and make sure we do get the right one. Mike's question is about diversity. We seem to have a model within the NHS 
that to be a chief exec, you need to have done 30 years within the NHS. International experience is not valued. Different industry experience is not valued. And whenever I talk to this with other NHS people, they say, well, Ian, you don't understand it. It's a very pressured job. So are chief execs in other industries. And 30 years experience within retail does not necessarily a requirement for being chief exec of a retail organization. Why is it that we have this mono view of what a chief exec looks like? So, well, it's chairman that appoint the chief executive, <laughs> so I thought you might have the answer to that. You do all just shift around jobs, though, in the NHS, don't you? Yeah. Just to be slightly it's, provocative. It's called protectionism. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The, I mean, the, 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 point, the point's valid. Um, it's about recognising difference. That's, that's the whole point for me around diversity. So we have had experiences where we have people who have been very successful as chief execs coming in, and they haven't understand the culture, they haven't understood the uh, media pressures and the context, and they fail. So that's been experience over many years. I think it's fantastic that we get a difference in diversity at le leaders, and we're about to launch an initiative later this year, led by the Secretary of State Post Francis, to expand on this. So we'll have to talk to you afterwards okay. about it. I'm already running over. Let's take one final, and can it be as brief as possible, question on microphone three. Hi there. Uh, Jamie Hewitt from the National Rheumatoid Arthritis Society, uh, representing a patient organisation. So unexpectedly, my question really is, uh, what role for patients as patient leaders of service redesign, uh, as opposed to the kind of shared um, no decision about me without me? So uh, what do people think about that? Because we've not really heard anything about that today. Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, one of the, the learning points for me, I think, in my leadership career, was, as I mentioned earlier on, was um, trying to make sure that we don't go out to patients and the public with a solution in terms of what the service should look like, uh, and then sell it to them, which I think is what historically we've done, but we actually really properly embrace patients in designing the services for their benefit in the future. I still think we've got a long way to go in learning what we actually mean by that. And if I take that example back into my current organization, Health Education England, there's some fantastic work going on that I saw uh, just like we, last week, for example, in Lancashire Teaching Hospitals, where they've actually got patients involved in educating doctors from day one medical students and postgraduate doctors set foot in the hospital. They actually have sessions with patients talking to them about what they expect from them as a doctor and really trying to, to start to turn the system on its head so that, as, as we've heard several times over the course of the last couple of days, that the focus is on the patient first and foremost and not on us telling patients what is right for them, the paternalistic approach. Amanda Doyle, you must be grappling with this in your role. We are. It's a key requirement to CCGs that we include the, patient, uh, the public and patients in our, in our decision-making about commissioning. And, it, and it's a mixture of things. It's working with specialist organisations like yours around specific pathways for patients. And it's working with the general public and patient participation groups around, around feedback and input to to our, our work in general. So the more we get contact from patient organisations, the happier we are. It's not easy to get that input. Just before we go, I can't lose the opportunity, Peter, of just asking you about, you didn't, the swipe at Francis over the threat of criminal prosecution. Does, is that going to make it harder to get leaders to step up? Quick yes or no from each of you before we... No, I don't, but I think it'll make the job, of, the, the everyday job for everybody harder right. if, that's in, if that's sitting looming over you. What about I, I think probably yes. I think it's important that, um, not that we go to the extent of disasters in care like we saw in Staffordshire, but actually we do allow people to learn and to make mistakes without the risks. Um, so it's going to make it harder. I think I agree with Peter. I don't think it'll put people off, but I think it will make the job harder. I think it actually might release some people who see a, a, a new level of openness and transparency about the problems that people face, and some people might step up to the plate as a result of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Jan Sobieri, Ian Cumming, Amanda Doyle and Peter Lees. Next time in here we've got uh, 4.30, it's David, Sir David Nicholson. <laughs>